Je voudrais tout d'abord remercier les organisateurs de m'avoir invité, présenter... Est-ce que vous m'entendez là Présenter des excuses tant aux organisateurs que aux auditeurs. Il faudrait que j'en présente des tas. Je vais juste mentionner les deux principales. L'une concerne le contenu de mon exposé. Le thème de ce colloque, c'est catégorie et physique. Il y aura bien des catégories dans ce que je vais raconter, mais il y aura, au moins à ma connaissance, pas ou peu de physique. Donc, j'ai prévenu et on m'a dit que je pouvais venir et parler quand même de, des allégories. Deuxième type d'excuses, vous avez vu le, le résultat, je suis une espèce de dinosaure qui ne sait pas taper des mathématiques, qui ne sait pas taper du tech, du tout ce que vous voulez, et par conséquent, il m'était impossible de vous donner des très belles projections comme celles que vous avez eues et celles que vous, avez, que vous allez continuer à avoir. Donc je suis obligé de me débrouiller uniquement avec un tableau. Noir, blanc, n'importe, mais du moment qu'il y a un tableau. Alors, il y a une troisième chose qui n'est pas des excuses, mais qui est une question. Je peux parler aussi bien, ou en tout cas presque aussi bien, en anglais qu'en français. Donc, je suis à votre disposition pour parler la langue qui vous convient le mieux, il suffit de me le dire. Voilà. Alors, est-ce que je parle anglais ou est-ce que je parle français Pardon Pour ceux qui sont anglophones, je pense que par politesse, on parle anglais. Oui, mais bon, il y a peut-être. Moi je, moi, je suis à la disposition des gens. So if if you prefer, prefer I can speak English. Okay, merci. English is okay. Okay. So I apologize for the French speaking persons. I'm going to the title of my talk is Allegories Revisited. Allegories is a part of category theory which is so far not very well known. So I'll have to say a few words about what an allegory is and give precise definition. Before I go into that, let me say that they were introduced by Fried and Shedrov in their book, which is called Categories, Allegories. This book has many strange features. It contains interesting results and notions, but it has many strange features. The, the strangest one is that it is a book which took 15 years for the two, two authors to write and 
incredibly as it may seem, there is no bibliography whatsoever. So it seems as if this was born like in uh, Minerva's head out of the blue. It is not the case. And I shall give only three or four bibliographical indications. What are allegories supposed to do? They're supposed to axiomatize the essentially algebraic structure of rela binary relations. Immediately, this is vague. Binary relations in what? In what kind of categories? Of course, if you are working in sets, binary relations will satisfy lots and lots and lots of axioms. If you are a top in a topos, they will satisfy a little less. Everybody will believe that. But if you are in more general categories, they will satisfy even less. In the case of sets, I think the first person who studied in a complete manner, or more or less complete manner, the structure of binary relation is Jacques Riguet. in 1948. But of course, as I said, he gave a lot of properties which binary relations in set satisfy, but some of them are not satisfied in more general situations. And moreover, st studying them only in set prevents you from looking at what happens if you are looking at binary relations in various categories, C and D, and comparing what happens for relations in C and relations in D and functors from C to D, etc. So, although it was nice, it's not, but of course in 1948, one could not imagine that he would do something for more general categories which had not yet been defined, for example, for regular categories. So, the work of Freyd and Chedrov is part of the axiomatization when you look at binary relations in, yes? Ah, well, then a category, let me say this, a category is regular. if it has finite limits, inverse limits, and every map can be factored where this is a regular epimorphism and this is a mono and moreover 
regular epimorphism are stable under pullbacks. And it's easy to see that these conditions are necessary to be able to compose binary relation, what is a binary relation from A. I shall denote things which are relations like this. It's sub-objects of the product A cross B. Binary relation is a sub-object of the product A cross B. And the composition, so let's say R has a map in A in the map in B and the pair PQ is jointly monic, is a mono in the product. And in that case, relations do compose, let's call PR, QR, PS, QS, They compose in the following manner. You take the pullback here. This pair of maps is not jointly mono, but because of the factorization, you can factor it as a regular epi followed by a mono. And this gives you the definition of the composition of R and S, and this composition is associative. And this requires these properties. By phi, Sorry, such, a, such a map. Partially yes? Partially. What's what? The question was, does he, does, is this a partial order? It's a partial it's order. Partial. By, by order, I always mean a partial order. Otherwise, they are the important one. Otherwise, if I want it to be total, I'll say total. No, it's a partial order. And given phi and say psi, phi and psi, the intersection, exists. This is the first axiom. Of course, if, if phi and psi are binary relations, they are ordered by inclusion and the intersection exists because I'm as, uh, assuming that the category where I work has finite limits. So first axiom. Second axiom, A is equipped with an involution <coughs> phi denoted by phi gives phi, phi zero where phi in A of AB And phi zero is in A of B A. And this is again trivial for relation. If we have a relation from A to B, we can view it as a sub object of A cross B, but A cross B is isomorphic to B cross A, and then we have the opposite. And this satisfies what? It preserves and reflects the order. It preserves and reflects the intersection. And phi 0, 0 equals phi. Phi 0 is called the opposite of phi. Let me just. And a third axiom.
is the following. Whoops. Uh, third axiom is obvious also, so the first will come. Composition. Since it's a category, we, we have composition. <coughs> composition preserves the order. And finally, the most important axiom, which they call the modular axiom, is the following. Suppose I have phi, Psi and T, like this. Then we can compose and form Psi Phi compo uh, intersects key. And the modular axioms says that this is smaller or equal. You take psi, you take key composed with phi zero, so they are both from B to C, so I can take their intersection and then I compose with phi and the modular axiom is this. Let me say again that this axiom in the case of relations in sets has been discovered by Rigue in 1948 and he called it not the, mod the modular law but the Dedekind axiom. So here are the axioms of allegories. And the very first remark I made is that if C is a regular category, relations of C not only compose, but form an allegory. However, there exist allegories with these axioms here, which are not of the form relations on a regular category. These axioms capture only a little bit of these allegories. In particular, in order to see that, every full subcategory of an allegory is again an allegory. Well, a full subcategory of a regular category does, just doesn't work. Okay. I'll try not to erase too much. Given an allegory, say A, 
we think of, I have forgotten to put, well, whenever it's, I put Greek letters, one has to think of them as binary relation. And then one wants to distinguish among them those binary relations which are functions. So one can define what is a map and for maps I use a Latin letter if and only if f zero composed with f is greater than the identity of a and f composed with f zero is smaller than the identity of b these are maps one sees Im immediately that maps do compose and much later in you will find also in the bibliography you will find a nice account of allegories in the elephant volume one of the elephant much later than the paper of uh, the book of Fred Shedroff, in the elephant you can find another characterization of a function. It's a morphism of the allegory which has a right adjoint. This says that F0 is the right adjoint of F, but it can be proved that if F has a right adjoint, this right adjoint is necessarily unique and equal to F0. So it's much nicer because you don't use the involution, you say it's property of adjunction, and this permits to extend, I'm not going to go into these extensions, the properties which I will mention of allegories to more general two categories or even by category. Yes, I don't have much time. If you don't mind, I'm willing to answer, but okay, so please ask your question, but then I'll answer any question at the end. But now ask it. I, I don't have the possibility to project things, so it takes much longer. And this is, these are well-known facts, which you can find in the elephant, for example. And I want to talk about less well-known facts or unknown facts. And I won't have the time, even in 50 minutes, to say not even a quarter of what I could say. Not that I'm not willing to answer, but uh, there's so much one can do in 50 minutes. So, I think I can erase this. It's a pair of maps these now are maps whereas phi is an arbitrary morphism a pair of maps PQ such that first of all phi is equal 
here we have p up equal to q composed with p up but not only that because there may be many such so first condition is this and second condition is that the pair pq is jointly monic which means if we had binary products the pair pq would be a map into the product a cross b and we impose that p is uh, pq is is a mono then one can prove the following thing if a tabulation exists it is unique up to a unique isomorphism and second it, it is universal in the following sense suppose we have maps again maps F and G which satisfy a weaker form of this equation namely so PQ is a tabulation of phi suppose we have F and G such that G composed with F up is smaller or equal to phi phi being tabulated by this PQ there is a unique map H which makes this diagram commutative. Uniqueness is trivial because the pair PQ is jointly monic and we want... Okay, this can be said in terms of adjunctions, etc. But the, the main thing is the notion of tabulation cannot, is not uh, essentially algebraic, one cannot express it in a category with finite limits. And they say that the category, the allegory A is tabular if every phi every morphism phi has a tabulation and they prove that if the allegory A is of the form rel of C where C is regular, then this is an allegory. It, that means it satisfies all the previous axioms, but it is always a tabular allegory. So this is a very quick view of what they do and they study tabular allegories and uh, more. So, we look at categories, we look at allegories, Here are regular categories, here are tabular allegories, and more or less with small details which I won't go 
into this piece here is the same as here. I, this is a equivalence between regular categories and tabular allegories. Okay. And in uh, in the elephant, Johnstone says, let me just add one definition, but it's an obvious one. Suppose A and B are allegories. It is obvious to define what's called a representation of allegories. It's a functor which preserves the order, preserves the intersection, and preserves the opposite, preserves all the structure. Okay? And if we look at this correspondence between regular categories and allegories. In this correspondence, every regular functor corresponds to a representation of allegories and vice versa. So it's this, more or less, it's the same thing. However, if we look at regular categories and the functors between them, there is a notion of natural transformation. So there ought to be some notion of natural transformation, whatever you want to call it, between two representations, F and G. So, I read what is said about that in the elephant. Where's my elephant? Here. The theorem which says that these two are bijection says theorem. 3 to 10 can be made functorial <clears throat> uh, it is possible though less straightforward to make it too functorial the right notion of natural transformation between morphisms of allegories is not just that of a natural transformation of functors, but something more complicated. We shall not go into details here. Therefore, we are with the following situation. Here, we have a two categories, namely functors, and natural transformation. And here we have only a category. And all we know is that if we forget about natural transformation, this category here and these are equivalent. But we have no idea of what is a morphism between two such representation. So, First question, is it possible to define morphisms between representations in order to have a two category of allegories? That is not done, and since it is not done, 
it doesn't even make sense to ask what property has these two categories. We don't know it as a two category, so we cannot ask what properties does it have. So I'm going to answer this and answer many other such questions. For example, given a regular category, C, then C2 is regular. So, we look at rel C. So this gives me a construction on regular categories. There should exist some construction on tabular allegory because they are supposedly the same. What is this construction? Again, given a regular category, C, and X is a category, what is A to the X as an allegory? And the fact is that not only you can, this, if I can solve this problem, that means I can solve it here for tabular allegories. But my answer is for any allegory, I can construct the slice, I can construct a to the 2, I can construct a to the x, etc. Whether the allegory is tabular or not tabular, and prove that in case the allegory is tabular, this construction gives again a tabular allegory. So I'll just sketch, and there are many, many other such uh, things which I won't have the time to go into. I'll just sketch how this works. Normally, there are many, many verifications because we want, starting from an allegory, to construct another, which means I have to prove that the other construction is again an allegory. The thing which makes everything tick is a very simple remark. And this remark consists in associating to any allegory a double category in the sense of Erisman, which I shall call the double category of admissible squares. Suppose A is an allegory. What I call an admissible square, and it's different from, say, what uh, uh, Guitar called exact square or things like that, which can be defined. Admissible square are not exact, exact square. What is an admissible square? Let me just in order not to mix my notation, look at my paper. Is a diagram of this form. All these are objects of A and uh, Morphism of A.
such that f and g are maps of the allegory. We have defined what's a map, thing which has an adjoint. Phi and phi prime are just arbitrary morphism of the category, of the allegory, and the diagram is not commutative, but we want that g composed with phi is smaller or equal to phi prime composed with f. Well, this condition is equivalent to many others. Let me just say a few ones. Everything which I'll write downstairs will be equivalent to this condition. F composed with phi zero is smaller than phi prime zero composed with g. g phi f zero is smaller or equal than phi prime. phi is smaller than g zero phi prime f and a lot of others. Let's just look at these. I shall write the following notation to say that this is a, a admissible square. I shall write this under the form phi phi prime F is a morphism from F to G. What does this tell me? It tells me that, well, it's easy to see that with the obvious composition, the composite horizontal composition of admissible square is again admissible, and vertical composition of admissible square is again admissible. What does this tell me? For example, this says if this is an admissible square, then I can put here again, this is admissible, which says with this notation, this says that phi zero, phi prime zero, g goes into f. Which says that we do have, for the horizontal composition, we do have a duality, a, 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 Involution, if we, if we want to say what's phi phi prime zero, take phi zero, phi prime zero, and it does work. We do have an involution. One can also show that uh, with a little bit more work, that for the horizontal composition, we have an allegory. We have the involution, we have the infs, which we take just uh, by taking inf, both inf. We have everything we want. So for the horizontal composition, we have an allegory. And again, it's a little bit more complicated, but if A 
is tabular, this is tabular. This is a little bit more tricky, but it can be proved. It's a bit surprising, but it can be proved. Okay. So, here we have an allegory. Here, for the vertical composition, we have a category. Okay. Now, we are ready to define A2. What is A2? The objects are maps of A. The morphisms between F and G, as I indicated here, are admissible squares. And this is an allegory which is tabular if A is tabular. We can define A to the X, where X is a category and A is an allegory and we want this to be an allegory. We can define this in which manner an object of A to the X is a functor F from X into map A. For each object X we have a map uh, uh, an, an object of A, and for each map, we have a map. And we want uh, defining A to the X. So here is a, an object. Suppose I, I have another object. What is a morphism between F and G is for each X we have FX, GX, and we want a phi X like this, or phi for each object X such that if I have a map little x from x to y in x I can put, since this is a functor I have here f of x uh, f of y are representations of allegories. One can define what is a morphism between these two representations and again using only admissible squares. How, how much do I have? Three. How much? Three minutes. Three minutes. So, okay, and we can define the two category of allegories, the two category of allegories. And the correspondence is between uh, uh, regular categories and tabular allegories is now two functorial, not just functorial, it carries to the transformations. What property has A to the X? Allegory morphisms from B to A to the X. I cannot resist to reading what he says.
in the chapter review of two categories, he says that was written in 2002. Even amongst experienced category theories, theorists, there is often a good deal of reluctance to take two categorical or still worse bicategorical notions seriously. This was written 35 years after my paper on bicategory and at the time when this was written everybody or at least every experienced categorist used two categories and used by categories and this is ah this is so nobody knows about that therefore no surprise that he didn't look at the structure of by category or of two category at least of allegories let me just add in one minute something which is very important much more complicated than all this but which has a philosophical flavor namely the following and i will finish with this Suppose A is an allegory, it's easy to define what is a congruence on A. It is an equivalence relation compatible with composition, with opposite, with, with everything. And that's just congruences in the most elementary algebraic sense. And to define the quotient a divided by the congruence. It is an allegory. You keep the same objects, but you don't identify morphisms. You add morphisms. You add formal inverses to the morphisms which existed here. How can these two things be the same? Here we identify morphisms, here we add morphisms and we end up with it being the same. And the answer, not proof, but intuitively, philosophically, whatever, the answer is the following. Here, if we have an allegory and we invert some maps these maps existed as relations in the allegory they existed and inverting them is just identifying if, if uh, it's such a map is represented by phi is identifying this with an identity and so we if we work with not only maps but relations these things we want to inverse their inverse existed already not as a map but as a relation Thank you for your...